Joining me now is Anand Girdadis. He is the author of several books, uh, including Winners Take All, including The True American. Um, uh, he is a contributor to MSNBC and Time Magazine. Um, he is also the publisher of The Inc. newsletter. Um, Anand, thanks so much for joining me. It's such a pleasure. Uh, the pleasure is mine. And I actually, I signed up for the newsletter and I've been, an enjoy, I've been enjoying it. And uh, I, I really um, appreciate the regular communication on issues with such quick and in-depth analysis. Like it, it's, it's short enough to keep my attention span, uh, but it's in-depth enough to actually give something substantive out of it. So thank you for doing that newsletter. Well, I appreciate that. You know, I, I, I just figured it was it was high time that I stopped uh, just venting in the shower as a way to process my feelings in the Trump era. <laughs> um, so I decided to, you know, turn, turn all of you into, into, into my shower walls. I, you know what, this, that's the exact reason I started this podcast. It was before the Trump era, but my wife definitely got tired of me venting around the house, shouting at the walls. And so, uh, that's kind of how this podcast got birth as well. <laughs> um, now you're from Shaker Heights, Ohio, correct? I am. I, uh, my family has extremely deep roots in Cleveland Heights, um, wow. which is like right, not too far next door. from, yeah, right yeah. next door to where you grew up. Um, so it's a, it's a really small world, but it, this journey has taken you all around the world. And as much as I want to just delve into like some of your background, uh, particularly your recent write up in TechCrunch about Silicon Valley, uh, we want to dig into that. I couldn't have you on the show this close to the recent, uh, presidential debate and not just get your opinion on what I think was probably one of the uh, worst experiences in terms of a presidential debate. And can we just, I mean, to speak personally for a second, what a shame that it was a Cleveland debate. I mean, for you and me, oh. right? My dad is, went to Case Western <laughs> University. So did mine. Oh, wow. Wow, man. We got a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, same similar backgrounds and, and, and paths crossed. And it was really a horrible thing to be featured at Case Western in Cleveland. It, it just was, it was painful. You know, last night, I, I mean, there's so many things to say and everybody has their own take on it and obviously feels a lot of the same things. I'll just share something that I just wrote about this morning as a way to kind of process what was going on, which is, which is often why I write. Um, I felt really bodily sick mm. after last night in a way that, I mean, the whole, this whole era is a, you know, catastrophe, but I felt bodily sick in a way that I only have maybe a few times in the last few years. And particularly, I remember feeling the night he won in 2016. I think mm. a lot of people ended up describing that feeling of a body sickness. I think some of these shootings we've seen have created that, that kind of moment of feeling it in your body, not just in your, in your head. And, and I felt that last night and I woke up this morning and wrote a little bit about my experience. And what was funny about, not funny, haha funny, but yeah. particular about the experience was, um, I have a five-year-old and a two and a half year old and my five-year-old has only seen, you know, we, we generally don't watch that much TV, but we, uh, in the spring we're watching one of the democratic primary debates and he happened to catch a glimpse of it. And he sees a lot of adult TV in passing and doesn't really impress him compared to the stuff he watches. Right. Um, but this debate format that he saw, he really liked it. He liked these two boxes with two people and going back and forth. Right. It was less chaotic than other TV. And he just really liked it. And he kind of said something like, you know, whenever there's more of these, like, let me know. So last night, this thing's coming on. Little do I know, it's the worst debate in American history about to dawn. Yeah. And, and he realizes what's coming. And he's like, can I stay up? So I put his sister to bed, let him stay up. And I proceed to watch this debate with my wife and my five-year-old boy in his little red and black plaid pajamas, which we oh, custom cut the bottom to look like shark teeth. So he's laying there watching this debate. And I realize... I am introducing my son to democracy at a moment where it feels like it's about to end. Wow. Right? I, I am teaching him about, like, the, the first president I'm introducing him to is a president inciting violence yeah. in a presidential debate. The first time I'm teaching him what voting is, you know, in a way that he's able to understand, is going to be a time when... Uh, 
a lot of votes just simply may not be counted. Yeah. And it just, it feels like obviously this twilight moment for democracy, twilight being something that, you know, can be sunrise or sunset. Yeah. And, and it was just this strange, surreal experience. And I realized for a lot of people of, you know, my rough age and generation, we are, we are training our children about democracy um, in this moment of its evaporation. Yeah. Those are the things that tr I think we're roughly in the same age group. I just turned 40 um, and I have a nine year old, a seven year old and a two year old. So we're, we're rearing kids kind of in the same situation. Yeah. And one of the things that is pressing upon me is um, the fact that it's, it's, it's almost like we're stuck between a rock and a hard place. It's either we choose um, neo fascism or neoliberalism, as Cornel West would put it. And every time I look at my kids, I'm like, you know what? I, I don't want to personally have to do it, but we're going to do it. We're going to pick Joe Biden. We're going to pick because at least that gives us more time to fight for a better, more progressive future. And you deal with a lot of these things in terms of income inequality, the wealth gap, um, uh, just in general, the class warfare that's waged on middle America and working America. Um, how are you balancing that in light of how did you come to balance that? Because I, I mean, it's clear we got to get rid of Donald Trump. I know that's no question in, in your mind or my mind. But what was that evolution like from dealing with the income inequality that could be represented by both neoliberals, but clearly facing neo-fascism? It's like we got to live. We got to let democracy live to fight another day. You know, it's such a good question. And 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 I think, you know, uh, to be clear for people listening to this who, you know, have no idea um, who I am or why you invited me on your show, like I am someone who in the primary process was not only skeptical of Joe Biden, I mean, I, I'm still skeptical of Joe Biden, but I was hostile to Joe Biden. I, I mean, I, I felt that Joe Biden's comments on black people needing to put the record player on and not being good parents to their children yeah. were disqualifying, frankly. And that's the language I used in a primary. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of people were like, you're gonna, you know, you're gonna pretend you never said this in the general. Well, here, here I am in the general saying, I did say that. And I did feel that you know, very strongly. Uh, I felt that there were actually millions of people in America, millions of white people, millions of men who have actually, you know, gone on these evolutions of learning to transcend certain mid 20th century things. And I felt Biden wasn't working as hard as he ought, yeah. wasn't working as hard as a lot of those other folks had to actually change. And I was real about that. However, you end up in an election in a specific choice. And I think for me, there is there is no comparison at all um, between these two men, first of all. Second of all, um, I think we project this false narrative of presidential saviorism mm -hmm. when in fact what has often made good things happen under particular presidents is what other people were doing to those presidents, not what those presidents were doing. Right. Someone on, I saw someone, maybe it was Walid Shaheed saying this on Twitter today. Maybe I'm getting it wrong. But, you know, uh, Lincoln wasn't an abolitionist. Uh, LBJ wasn't necessarily the most, you know, uh, politically correct person when it came to black people. Right. Um, FDR, you know, I forget the one there, but FDR was not necessarily uh, was not a socialist. Right. But why do they all end up doing things that on those issues are more dramatic than than anyone would have thought possible because of what everybody else was doing right out of the frame of the photograph, right. right? They were being acted on, right? And so I don't think there's a single black person in America today who, who worries more about the internal contents of LBJ's heart when he was signing the Civil Rights Act or the Voting Rights right. Act. Who cares? I care that he passed those damn things and signed them. Right. Yeah. And I don't I mean, like, I care about what's in your heart if it's before. But if you got that done, you got that done. And 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 the reason he got that done was not some come to Jesus moment. It was mm. pressure. It was the real working of democracy. Yeah. And so I think there is a weird way in which my expectation and maybe yours and others that Biden becomes something he is not 
is a misplaced expectation because it's not necessary. A, it's not something likely to happen, but B, it's not a necessary thing. What we have to do very simply, according to our history, is change the calculus in which he operates. If we, Joe Biden, unlike, this is a very important point I think about a lot. The people, democratic socialists, real progressive, people like Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, others, have a philosophical conviction around their set of issues, right? Centrists, like neoliberal centrists like Biden, do not, in my view, mm -hmm. have a philosophical, an equal and opposite philosophical conviction of neoliberalism. Like they, they don't believe in like some great neoliberal philosophers. Like right. th their conviction is the absence of a conviction, right? Mm -hmm. Like <laughs> what is in their vessel is emptiness, right? Like Joe Biden believes what Bernie Sanders believes at 90% dilution. It is not, <laughs> like I, I mean that very seriously. Like yes. he believes in the same idea. He just doesn't, j just with like less courage, less conviction, less philosophical thought throughness. So what that means is that if you make it more expensive for Joe Biden to not do Medicare for all than to do it, I assure you, Joe Biden would not be willing to pay a huge political price for his conviction of not doing Medicare for all. Like mm. that is not a conviction. Right. It is a lack of conviction. And so these people are malleable to changing the facts of the world and changing the incentives around them in a way that people with conviction are not. So much that we have the ability to apply that type of pressure from our side of the equation. Correct. And so part of that is, when, when it gets back to your original question, part of that is like, therefore making sure you get people in office who are at least remotely subject to that pressure right. and, and gonna be part of a democratic process as opposed to someone who's literally not you know, a believer in democracy, um, getting rid of this, you know, fight like hell in the primary, but then don't take your ball and go home, you know, right. understand that, that a lot of flawed, uh, flawed presidents have done great things. And a lot of brilliant presidents have not done much. You know, I, I, I think if you look at LBJ's background and Barack Obama's background, um, I think they're, the records of real change in office would surprise you, mm. right? Uh, you know, I, I think in retrospect, and Barack Obama had plenty of headwinds that were not of his making, Right. but his background would have predicted for me a much more radical transformative presidency than the one we got. It's very hard to predict these things. Right, right. And so having a sense of humility around, you're gonna get who you're gonna get, and then you're gonna work like hell to try to make them um, meet the moment and meet, meet your demands. You know, in, in, in your response there, you also gave a pathway to some solutions, right? Um, it, it, does, it is very easy to become disillusioned with the state of America right now um, and the possibility of Donald Trump getting a second term. But if we are able to get him out of office, or even if we don't get him out of office, you kind of outline the keys. And the keys are like organizing to be able to apply immense political pressure at a level that they cannot ignore. And I think one thing that I would like for you to speak to definitely is the extent to which we make the mistake of winning and going to brunch are losing and taking our ball home, like you stated, versus continuing to organize at every level, politically, in labor unions, mutual aid, media, um, organizing every single day because we have to maintain those channels of power to apply that type of pressure. Absolutely. And, and I want to say something about two books that I read in the last couple of years. One, one very recently, Evil Geniuses by Kurt Anderson, mm -hmm. which I reviewed for The New York Times. And then another um, called Dark Money by Jane Mayer. And these are both incredibly detailed. I mean, in Jane's case, investigative, like she unearthed this stuff herself. In Kurt's case, more of a synthesis of other research. Um, but a both stories of the hijacking of America by the political right, by the rich and the right over the last generation, right? Detailed, 
wallets full of receipts story mm. of how the right did it, right? Who the families were, which CEOs, which companies, what memos they wrote starting in the 70s, what they were afraid of, how they felt they were losing ground, how they organized political power, captured it, got it, multi-pronged approach. And there's a couple takeaways from both of these books that I think the left really needs to learn. And Anderson's book says this explicitly, that this should be inspiring to the left because the right was out of power in the 70s. They were afraid all the long-haired hippie people were you know, overtaking America, right? They were afraid we might lose the Cold War. They thought they were losing, and so they got organized. And what they did that I think the left needs to think about is they didn't just focus on the presidency and the Senate. They focused on very wide, deep, comprehensive institution building across the length and breadth of this country. And that meant um, obviously politics and there was a lot of political money giving, but it meant things like the Federalist Society, right? Now, I despise the Federalist Society, but if that's the, the world you wanna live in, if you want to live in a world where women have back alley abortions, which is a terrible world to want to live in, but if that's the world you want, that is a brilliant strategy. Not just, you know, clamoring on Twitter for the, a judge you want, but going 30 years back and creating an entire farm system for nurturing right wing talent. So as soon as you get to Harvard Law School, you have your people. You have your networks. You have your tribe. Federalist society, right? They went to universities. They created economics programs. They created law and economics at the University of Chicago and replicated those programs elsewhere, nurturing students. They gave out journalism awards. I once applied for a journalism award. I think when I was a journalist in India, something about human rights and liberty, I had no idea. I find out years later from reading Jane Mayer's book that it was a Koch Brothers funded award where they were getting like liberal journalists to apply for awards, framing their work as being about liberty, right? Wow. Um, there was an insidious, deep, wide conquest of all different sectors of American life. And they understood power, they understood association building, they understood movement building. They take care of their thinkers. This is another thing. Mm. I know so many people who live in, you know, near or slightly above poverty as writers, who are writing things that are pushing forward the thinking of the country, of the left, of where things should be on race, on class, right? And barely able to make ends meet. I assure you, no one who is running intellectual interference for the right wants for anything. Hmm. They take care of their thinkers, right? Yes. They, they give them grants. They put them in you know, sinecures and think tanks. They take care of their Charles Murrays. If you are doing intellectual work repping their interests, you will be taken care of, right? Whereas we leave out, we leave all of our thinkers out to pasture and hope they uh, figure out a way to you know do a Patreon. <laughs> exactly. Uh, right. So there's a whole bunch of things the right did at all levels, exactly as you say, understanding all levels of power, right? Understanding all the different offices you can run for, that frankly the left, I think, has been too too ignorant about. And, and the next time before you complain about Donald Trump or Mitch McConnell, remember there are 90,000 different government entities in the United States, 90,000, mm. right? Those guys control two of the 90,000. They control two really important ones but two of 90,000, state, federal, local, cities, so on and so forth, right? You take important issues like the fair work week. Can you jerk around workers' hours week to week, change their hours without notice, right? A practice legal in some places, not legal in others. That is an issue that can be done at the city level. How many right. liberal cities with liberal mayors, progressive mayors, how many progressive cities have a fair work week in a way that Idaho doesn't? You know what? Embarrassingly few. Right. Right. I think there's a level of disillusionment because with with the people who do obtain power and obtain power in the name of progressivism. And then when they get in power in these some of these cities, um, we see that they enact policies that are antithetical to progress or at least uh, could easily be considered, quote unquote, neoliberal. What do you say then to this 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 
juncture that we're at, right? We're at a juncture where it's almost as if the left left, the, the those of us that are left of Bernie Sanders are really ready to throw in the towel because that center left uh, representation that has power, even if we look on the federal level from from the neoliberals on the federal level all the way down to local city level, their their vision of of leadership and power has always been complicit with that rightward shift in this country. Do you feel like is it safe to say that that's a part of that overall mandate by right wingers that they've been working on for 30, 40 years, that even the even the people who take our name as progressives and go into power, they are still being affected by that same unseen but ubiquitous machine of right wing influence. And if that is the case, where do we even begin to actually fix that? Because we are out here to drive. We are trying to survive on Patreon. We are like dog eat dog. We're just we, we're not organized financially and we don't have those resources. So if the people who are in power, like right uh, uh, neoliberals, are in, impacted by that right wing ubiquitous but unseen machine, how do we get started fighting back against that as real leftist uh, progressives? It's so such a good question, and 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 I, so here's here's my thought on that. I mean, I, my my winners take all book is entirely in an elaboration, an explication of how that process has worked. How essentially a an intellectual and political project that began on the right, the anti-government, pro-business policies of the right, essentially created this kind of watered down clone on the left hmm. um this kind of center left neoliberal you know lighter facsimile of itself right. in order to to secure a really big majority so you you know ronald reagan is the pure the pure vodka version of this worldview the neoliberal worldview um bill clinton saying the era of Big government is over is the kind of warm beer version mm -hmm. of the same idea. Um, Margaret Thatcher saying there is no such thing as society. Think of that sentence. There's no such thing as society. Only individual men and women. Um, mm -hmm. She clearly didn't believe in non-binary people either. Um, and you know, she's saying that is is the vodka chilled vodka shot version of that. Um, Tony Blair coming in, um, you know, years later. Is the is, is the warm beer? So the kind of warm beer version is the you know is the Mark Zuckerberg, Jeff Bezos. These are all people who probably vote for Democrats, mm -hmm. um, uh, but who fundamentally are part of exactly what you described. This you know they're fundamentally not interested in system change, and you know as I wrote in my book, they will use their gestures of do-gooding and whatever to actually stave that off. So you're right, and. And I would summarize that as saying, therefore, folks like you and me who want to actually have real change in this country and progressive change in this country and who want, you know, things like a wealth tax or universal daycare or debt relief or Medicare for all or Green New Deal, those kinds of policies. It is absolutely true that we are up against a power structure that is not only the right, but the vodka version of the right plus mm that coalition on the left that is the kind of warm beer. Um, and so that's a lot of people. I think I will make a countervailing point to the left that, that you may or may not agree with. I'm curious for your thoughts, okay. which is I think when you are up against power and a big power structure, when you're up against Goliath, it and, and, and there's no question that, that progressives are, it is possible to get into a mental state where you're unable to see that some of the problem is your own limitations also, right? Mm -hmm. Because if the Goliath's over there, it's quite obvious that that's your real, that's your real issue, right? Um, you know, when you see someone like Bernie Sanders treated the way he is in the media, there just cannot be a doubt that corporate media and the critique of corporate media as manufacturing consent and limiting um, viewpoints, like that's real. You can't deny that when you see what happens to someone like Bernie Sanders. Okay, fair. I think what sometimes happens on the left is that there's a short circuiting of the process where there's an assumption that if that stuff were to be fair, there would be a big supermajority ready and willing to do the things progressives want to do. That in other words, progressives have no persuasion problem. They just have a power problem. Okay. And I think that's manifestly not true. 
You know, I, I think there's some issues that pull very well for progressives. But I think the exciting thing here is there's a bunch of headroom here for the progressive ideas. I do not think we have done the job we could do, could easily do, to persuade a greater number of Americans to want certain things that, frankly, even in a fair fight, they do not want right now. And they don't want because of that power structure, because of false consciousness, because of you know, a lot of brainwashing. But I think there's something that is sometimes missed that in the United States of America, for a bunch of fucked up reasons, you know, people making 30 grand a year in northern Wisconsin, like it's a genuine feeling that that getting health care would be a socialist takeover that mm. they dread. Now, mm. that's I'm going to be real. Like, that's a dumb opinion, particularly if you're a th person making thirty thousand dollars a year in northern Wisconsin. But it is in a but it is a sincere opinion. And I think if if those of us who want those types of things essentially view all of that as being the product of of um, power structures and don't think about the fact that even with those power structures in place, we could do a better job of making arguments that make those positions um, more saleable to more Americans, um, you know, it would be. It would be really great for the movement. And I'll give you, you know, two different examples with Bernie Sanders, someone I spent time covering. You know, Bernie Sanders, a lot of people don't know this. You probably do know this. But Bernie Sanders, um, you know, if you think about what's his signature domestic policy issue, it's health care, right? Mm -hmm. I have asked this to so many audiences I've spoken to, and virtually no one knows the following fact. Bernie Sanders' mother was killed by a bad health care system, right? Mm. It, they couldn't afford the medical bill. Did you know that? No, I actually, I didn't. He was 18 or 19 years old, about to go to college, change his whole trajectory. Um, and when I was doing the fact-checking process on my Time Magazine article, we are trying to just pin down the date of her death. You know, 60 years later, it's still so painful for him that his advisors asked me to only ask like one factual question about the date per day so they wouldn't have to ask him two things at once on a given day about his mother's death 60 oh, years wow. later. Okay, so that's, it's a searing, understandably searing personal memory. And I will say to you, with all due respect to Bernie Sanders, the fact that you didn't know that is not your fault. Hmm. That's Bernie Sanders' fault, Yeah. right? Because a lot of people in America don't want Bernie Sanders' healthcare idea, but, would succumb to a story about his mom and how he is gonna spend every remaining day of his life fighting to avenge the system that killed her and that he will not rest until no one else's mom leaves them too early. Let me ask you a quick question. How are you on time? Because because you, I'm, you, I'm you, good. You've opened up some a can of worms here that you you what you've just stated, I have to agree with, um, without a doubt. I think we do have a convincing problem on our side. Um, and it's not because we don't have the better arguments. I think it is because we are going up against headwinds of 40 years of, of, of indoctrination that you said something that it was, I have to touch on this false consciousness. Like it's like a false epiphany that these people have been given. And one of the most difficult things that I've ever come across in my work in my life has been trying to circumvent, get around and overcome a false epiphany that has been given to so many people in so many different communities to the point where they will reject something that is clearly good for them because somebody else got to them first yes. with a lie. Yes. That is has been the big, and I think that's the biggest challenge for us as progressives, because what we're, we're, we're dealing with an even more pernicious lie right now. The lie that we're dealing with right now is this lie of false equivalence. The false equivalence between that, that what we're fighting for is just the opposite side of the same coin of what conservatives are fighting for. When clearly we are fighting for things that are so fundamentally different that I don't believe that, I don't think that we're inherently good, but I think this is turning into an, a, a fight of inherently good versus evil. And so, but what, what, what bothers me is that we fall into the trap that you just said because we think it's an issue of power, but then we start giving away the power by not recognizing the urgency of the moment. 
the urgency of COVID-19, but we still can draw this false equivalence between Joe Biden and, 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 and Donald Trump. The urgency of the depression level, uh, levels of unemployment, right? Where we could be doing, we could be doing our part to convince people that what we have is even better than Joe Biden, but we're just kind of ceding that territory as leftists because of our disillusionment. And I, 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 I don't, I haven't quite figured out how we overcome not only the false epiphanies that are prevalent in people in Wisconsin making $30,000 a year, but also those that have been sold into the leftist movement that really believes that neoliberalism is just as bad as neo-fascism, which not only gives way to these lies, right? But it also cedes power, not to neoliberals, but we're giving power to people who will be more than happy to tear down the institutions that we need to work through to fix these things. Yeah. Just, I, I know I said a lot, but what are your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, two things. One, you know, I think there's a, I, I was just interviewing, um, uh, you know, a great, a great activist, and uh, I, I, kinda, I don't want to say who it is just because it's for this book yeah. I'm writing. It's a little bit secret for now, but you know, but but she said something that I found very important for the left, and this is an icon of the left. She said, "Often we do very bad threat assessment on the left, yeah. right? Like we we should be vocal about all threats to our liberty, right? But you got to do threat assessment. Like different people threaten you different amounts, right? And you know." Uh, people who, um, people who, for example, refuse to say your pronouns correctly, they're mm -hmm. a threat, and that's a really big problem, right? But people who want to murder you because you're trans yeah. is a different level of problem, yeah. right? And and it's important to fight both those problems in a way that recognizes different tiers of threat, right? Um, White people who who feel uncomfortable living in a world in which whiteness is decentered feel uncomfortable in a town um, that used to be one thing and now is different, right? Mm -hmm. They're going to vote in a racist way in all likelihood. And that's problematic. But if you're doing threat assessment, they are different from the Proud Boys. Yes. And you and me left alone on a road trip with a couple of the former people, I think could make some progress on them. Yes. You and me are not going to make progress in the Proud Boys. Right. And so I think threat assessment is just an incredibly important um, concept in, in the kind of work that you need to do when you're, when you're doing this convincing. If I could add real quickly, the fact it's compounded, what you just said is compounded and magnified a hundredfold with the president basically telling Proud Boys to be on standby last night. Like, Correct. That amplifies it. Well, then he, and, he, and then what he's doing by that, by the way, is like the Proud Boyification of his latent followers, right? So in a way, mm. what he's trying to do is like make them all Proud Boys. and 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 But they're not all Proud Boys. And there are people who, you know, th there are people who like him because he's racist and there are people who like him in spite of the fact that he's racist. Mm. And they're both problematic, but it's a different problem. And, and you and I would need to use different arguments for those different people. Yeah. Uh, and you and I should allocate our time very differently to those different people. And so I think we just need a, a lot better thinking around that. And, and to go back to Bernie, you know, so, so there was the mom story and just like, you know, story, my, my, my bigger point there is like story is a way is, is like a backdoor to winning over people who don't like your ideas formally. Mm. Right. They, they think they, they think they have like a left brain problem with your ideas, but, but somehow the story gets past their defenses. Right. And you and I, and every, mm. like why do, why do pastors talk in sermons? <laughs> Sorry, sorry, not sermons. Why, why do pastors, why do sermons, yeah. like, why are they consist of stories? Yeah. Why are the ideas, like, boiled down to 3% of a sermon? Because, you know what, they, the pastors know that if they got up there every Sunday and told you their ideas, which is, of course, their real agenda, they're trying mm -hmm. to tell you what to think. But they know that if they were to be perceived as telling you what to think, even yes. though they're the pastor— It'd be your walls would go up, your defenses would go up, right? 
and you'd in your mind tell them to you know go fly a kite I feel so exposed by what you just said because I, I do that for a living on my podcast. I do that. I actually come from the black church tradition. So we 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 are notorious as telling you some parables because we know if I if I just told you exactly what I thought, you would reject it. So I give you the parable and then it, and it locks in. It so then if in. we know that culturally, yeah. why I feel a lot of the folks who want what you and I want run politically in an incredibly heady way, an incredibly brainiac way, right? Elizabeth Warren's campaign was a brainiac campaign, right? And there was some folksiness in there. But what I'm really talking about is like, let's actually, to quote, a, a, I think a French cinematographer, a movie maker that I, that I used to quote in my journalism class, you got to hide the ideas. Yeah got to hide the ideas, which is what every pastor you grew up with understood and what a lot of these folks don't. A second thing about Bernie running, uh, you know, Bernie was running in this primary. If he had won, who would he have faced in the general election? A literal Nazi. Yeah. Okay. Um, interestingly and very sadly, tragically, Bernie's, several of Bernie's family members were murdered in the Holocaust. Right. Now, you know that one. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people don't. And he talked about it very, very sparingly right. in the campaign. And and you think about in this country, the United States of America, people are incredibly proud of the story of American soldiers going to Europe and helping to defeat the Nazis. So why wouldn't you play into that? What I am suggesting to you is the ideas of Bernie Sanders are the ideas – that we need to do, but you have to also play in the vernacular of American politics and play to the reality of how people absorb information and understand that there is post-Cold War trauma where people are afraid of socialism and communism, irrationally afraid, but that's where we are. Right. And there is a way past all that, but I think it's gonna require a politics that actually meets people where they are in a way that I think has not dominated in a lot of progressive approaches so before i let you go first of all i gotta tip my hat off to you for doing and demonstrating in this conversation exactly what you're saying we should do um how we can present the idea with narratives right thank you for doing that in this because at the very end of the conversation um it was an epiphany for me that we can always circumvent the false epiphanies one because of what we're fighting for if we can introduce it to them, not so much as an explicit idea for them to chew over intellectually, but as an emotional appeal based on the stories that we have, like that, that's how we get around a false epiphany. We can give them a true epiphany because our stories, what we're fighting for is just right. It's just Correct. moral. It's just it is good. It is inherently good. But if we leave it to them to argue about it intellectually, they're going to fall back onto the emotional appeal of the false epiphany that they've been sold, uh, that has been sold into their lives for the last 40 years, 40, 50 years for that matter. And think about someone like Reverend Barber. Yep. Who, you know, I, I don't know his exact positions on everything, but I guess would be pretty close to a Bernie Sanders or an Elizabeth Warren on oh, yeah. a bunch of different policy issues, certainly on worldview, on a sense of what needs to happen with power structures in American life, has a race class analysis, yep. you know, together. Um, my guess would be, and we could, you know, do some fancy polling and see maybe I'm wrong. My guess would be that a lot of people who hear Barber, including the kind of people who, you know, think the commies are going to get us and who think uh, communist takeover of healthcare is very dangerous, oh, those types of people. My guess is Reverend Barber fools a lot more of those people than Bernie Sanders. Mm. Yeah. My, be because the, the medicine has just so much sugar in it with him. Yeah. And I don't think people necessarily realize what they're getting because they're getting a story, they're getting moral language, they're getting a language of patriotism. The policies are hidden. I mean, it's partly maybe he's not even allowed. I don't know what the legal issues are there. But he is someone, I think AOC is another person, where there is a language to reach for 
that turns these things into deeply American things, into deeply moral things, into righteous things, and takes them out of the realm of politics. Once something enters the realm of politics, it just dies in American life today, right? It's, it's frozen into a tribal fight and there's no possibilities anymore, right? Um, if we can actually draw upon these other languages through which we have convinced each other over the years, whether it's the language of the black church, whether it's the language yeah. of Catholic workers, whether it's the like, social workers, whether it's the language of farm workers movements, there are these other vocabularies in our, in our collective DNA um, that I think are much more useful into getting e into each other's heads. Mm. We've been leading, in a way, we've been leading with the intelligentsia kind of approach. We've been leading with the, the, the navel-gazing kind of academic approach to socialism versus the human, um, the, the emotional, the, the, the just, right? The, the justice part of this, the love and the compassion, um, which probably, honestly, the reason I had like 3,000 people watching my stream last night um, after the debates at like 2 in the morning was because of the appeal of love and concern and compassion. And because I, I think there's a healing balm in that. Um, and, and, and I just want to thank you for elucidating that because we win or lose, win or lose, people are going to need that healing message. They're going to need that message. And if it leads to, obviously it points to policy, right? But that's how we bring them. That's how we bring them along. We bring them along by first touching them with our narratives, with our stories, whether they be personal, anecdotal, whatever it is, in a way that 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 the compassion of even the most brutish person cannot ignore. Yes. I think that's what it, even the most brutish person cannot ignore. I, 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 go ahead. Let me leave you with just one uh, one anecdote that I that really has always struck me about politics in in 2008 during the Obama campaign. I mean, you know, a guy serves eight years, you forget how completely improbable it felt even when it was in the midst of occurring. Yeah. And there were all these stories, some of them have been written down, some of them have been shared, but a bunch of people were doing phone banking. It was probably one of the first campaigns where you had all this online-based phone banking where you could you know, get these phone numbers on the web and then you'd call people. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people were doing this phone banking and people were calling, you know, often states they had some connection to. If you had a family connection to Ohio, you'd be calling Ohio. And there's all these stories that surfaced from 2008 that you may remember where people would would call these like rural um, white communities and someone would pick up the phone like an older white rural voter mm -hmm. um, would pick up the phone and be like, yeah, yeah, I'm voting for the N-word. <laughs> right? I completely, I, now that you mentioned it, I, now I remember it, yes. So, like, what is going, and by the way, I'm sure those are the people who went to Trump, right? Right, right. But, but before that happened, think about that for a second. Barack Obama won a substantial number of people who hate people like Barack Obama. Yeah. Right. Like you can't fix who we are in a two year campaign. Right. Mm -hmm. But you can make people feel things. You can tell a story that actually gets people to come with you in spite of themselves. Mm -hmm. They can hate you and still want to walk your direction. Right. They can be terrified of what you're going to do to their health care, but still feel like you're fighting for them. Mm -hmm. Right. They can. They can think that your kind of change is going to bring back risks, bringing back the kind of centralized government that you were so proud you helped resist as a soldier in the Korean War, whatever it is. But if you make them feel a certain thing, if you, if you paint the promised land for them, they will come with you. Mm. And I think we can never, ever forget that. But the, and, you, and, and we cannot afford to forget that in particular. The bigger the things we want to do, the more real the change we want to make. Wow. Hey, man, first, first and foremost, thank you so much for taking this time. We, we actually went twice the amount of time that we're supposed to, so I appreciate the extra time. And we yet didn't even get a chance to get to the reason I asked you to come on, which was the problems in Silicon Valley. But obviously, we're going to table that for another conversation if I could have you back. We'll do it. We'll do it again anytime you want. Awesome. Thanks so much. For your Thank time, you man. so much. Such a pleasure Take to care. talk to you.
pleasure's mine. Take care.